It's nice to be here at Northwestern, uh, especially since occasionally I get quoted as if I'm from Northwestern. Uh, you know, the media sometimes mix up Northeastern with Northwestern. I also have to tell you that I'm, I'm, I have this. This is not a pointer, although it worked well as one. Uh, I'm legally blind. And I say that, by the way, that's better than being illegally blind. Uh, I only say that because I might have to squint once in a while. And I'll put this over here so it's not in the way. Yeah, why don't you take that? So let's get started. Um, of course, Extreme Killing is the most recent book. You can purchase it, of course, online, but I'm not trying to sell books here. And especially not trying to sell this book. That was the first of many that we wrote about mass killing. And I, the only reason I show that is, is for the credentials, the idea to let you know that I've been working on this topic for over 40 years, because that's me, I, the one on the left. Uh, obviously, I don't look like that anymore, but that shows you how long I've been working on this topic. But back then, Back in the 80s, I started in 1982. Back in the 80s, no one was talking about mass shootings, certainly not academic, not the public either. But we did have cases back then, some really big ones. You know, for example, 21 killed at the McDonald's restaurant in San Ysidro, California, which the Daily News, New York Daily News, called Mass McMurder uh, and Big Mac Attack. Great headlines, I guess. Uh, we had we had 23 people killed at Luby, Luby's Cafeteria in Colleen, Texas. Uh, 14 killed at a post office in Edmond, Oklahoma, which gave rise to the term going postal. And then finally, we also had an elementary school shooting. You know, when Sandy Hook happened years later, people were amazed that, wow, we have one in an elementary school? I can understand a high school, but elementary school? Well, we did have one back then, too where five were killed and 30 were injured. So it was happening, but very few people were paying attention. But then came 2012, the real turning point, the watershed year. They say that bad things happen in threes and three really bad things did happen. We had seven killed at, o at Oikos University uh, in California. We had the shooting at the Aurora movie theater, you probably remember that, where 12 people were killed. It was a midnight showing of a Batman movie that just came out. And of course, the really well-known one, Sandy Hook Elementary School, where 26 were killed, 20 students and 21st graders and six uh, faculty members and staff members. Uh, that actually was named by Associated Press. They always have a, a ranking of the top news stories of the year. And Sandy Hook uh, was a top story of the year. It beat out the presidential election of that year and all the debates. And it also beat out the other Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, which actually killed many more people than the elementary school shooting. But the difference being that uh, Hurricane Sandy killed primarily senior citizens. Not that we do matter, of course, but it certainly didn't have the impact uh, on America's consciousness than did the shooting at the school. So now everyone's interested. So this, for example, is a, shows you uh, what people were Googling, what people were searching online. And prior to 2012, no one really was interested in mass shootings, hardly ever searched for it. And then since 2012, we saw this upward trajectory in how often people were searching. And then during the pandemic, there was a dip because people were obviously obsessed with that issue. And since then, it's re rebounded. So certainly the public is interested and so are academics. Now this graph shows you uh, the increase since 2000 in journal articles published every year in criminology journals. We can add to this psychology journals and medical journals and political science. There are now thousands a year. Uh, you know, when I started doing this work in the early 80s, I could read the whole literature in the weekend. Now I don't even try to keep up on it. It's just too much stuff <laughs> being published. Everybody's now an expert, I guess, on mass shootings. Well, there's this idea out there that you hear often that mass shootings are an epidemic. 
you know, I, I, I watch uh, Morning Joe every morning. Uh, you know, Joe Scarborough saying that we're in the midst of an epidemic of mass shootings. He said that a few years ago. And Mika uh, Brzezinski um, just last year also said that we are have an epidemic of mass shootings. Uh, and I watched The View, also in The View, uh, mass shootings epidemic. And Beto O'Rourke, now you can understand and why he used some colorful language because the this was right after the El Paso Walmart shooting in his hometown of, of El Paso. So that had special meaning for him. So this idea that I hear all the time that we have an epidemic, I'm not sure how we're gonna define epidemic, but I'm gonna suggest that we don't have one. Well, actually we do. We have an epidemic of fear. By every measure, fear is soaring. Uh, Chapman University has this fear index that they do every year, except they skip during the, the emergence of the pandemic. And as you can see, the uh, increase in people fearing mass shootings tripled over just several years. American Psych Psychological Association survey, 79% uh, of Americans say they're stressed out over the risk. Um, six out of 10 Americans say that they think and fear that there'll be a mass shooting in their community. Uh, and 21% of Americans say that they avoid certain places. They don't go to concerts or maybe don't go to church because they're afraid there's gonna be a gunman there. And most amazingly, this survey a couple of years ago asked people, what is, what is responsible for the most gun deaths in America? And 24% of the people said mass shootings, even more than suicide. I mean, that's suicide, more suicides than homicides, much less mass shootings. So clearly there's a this distorted view. Uh, of course, mass shootings do get more, much more publicity than other kinds of homicide and suicide. But the fear is there. And you can see it in lots of ways. Uh, for example, it's at Simmons College where in Boston, as well as University of Michigan. There were parties and a balloon popped. Someone screamed active shooter and the school went on lockdown. In fact, in, in Boston, uh, even the hospitals went on lockdown because of this active shooter, which was just a balloon. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, uh, at the town center mall in Boca Raton, Florida, a balloon popped. Someone yelled active shooter. They evacuated the mall and there was a helicopter with flying over the, over the mall. CNN tuned in live to cover this active shooter. There wasn't one, it was a balloon and only one person got injured. They got injured by hitting their head, trying to escape this active shooter. So people are scared, and that's really where the epidemic is. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you some numbers. I don't want to you know, bore you with too many statistics, which is in my line of work, math murder. But it's important to know the facts. Now, as Lori mentioned, I manage the Associated Press USA Today Northeastern University Mass Killing Database. It's a database of every mass killing, and we define mass killings in the traditional way, four or more people killed within 24 hours. Now we look at not just shootings, by the way, 20% uh, of the cases are stabbings, like, like for example, at the University of Utah. Um, I'm sorry, Idaho, sorry, University of Idaho. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, there was a mass stabbing uh, recently in Hawaii, uh, uh, arson murders, bludgeoning. So there are others, but 80% are shootings. And that's what people really focus on. Uh, mass killings by other means do not get the same kind of press as a mass killing by gunfire because it does, you know, the latter brings up this whole issue of gun control, which is a much heated topic, of course. We don't really have knife control uh, or balloon control. Uh, so overall, since 2006, over 3,000 people killed in these incidents. Uh, nearly 600 incidents and over 700 perpetrators. Now I'm only gonna fo focus on the shootings. Now this here <clears throat> shows you the trends since 2006 in the number of mass shootings. As you can see, there really isn't much of a change, at least from 2006 to about 2019 and 20. And in the last few years, there's been a little spike upward. 
A lot of that probably has to do with the pandemic, has to do with the economic hardship that people are feeling, uh, and some of the, the, the divisiveness in our country. Uh, lots of factors now that, that contribute to this increase. Uh, but I also want to point out the red. See, the red are the public mass shootings. Churches, schools, restaurants, universities, as opposed to the blue, which is all the others. And I, it's the red that people fear. But at most, there's been 10. Last year, there were 10. The most we've ever had is 10. Now, obviously, when it happens, it's horrific, such as the shooting last year in, in Maine, uh, where 18 people were killed. And when they happen, it's horrible. But still 10 perpetrators. So it's hard to call that an epidemic. And as I mentioned, uh, the public incidents, which are in red here, are a relatively small share. 23% of mass shootings are in public places. The biggest chunk, the biggest pie piece, are family massacres. Typically, a guy kills his whole family, sometimes himself and the kids, to keep them all together in the afterlife. Uh, another segment are, are, are felony-related, gang shootings, drug-related uh, killings, robberies, where they, where they uh, kill all the witnesses. Those don't get the press. The ones that get the press and the fear, of course, are the 23, which average about six a year, and the most being 10. So these, this is public mass shootings. And they have increased over the years, over the decades. As you can see, back in the 80s and 90s, they were average around two or three a year. Now it's averaging about six a year. Now that's more than double, but, but still, six is twice three. But we're not talking about large numbers in terms of the magnitude of the increase. And also keep in mind that over that time period, the population of the country grew by 50%, which accounts for some of the growth. So this is growing, and but again, hard to call an epidemic when it happens so few times a year. But what is actually noticeable about the past few years is the uh, magnitude of these killings, the severity. There had been in our nation's history, nine mass shootings with at least 20 people killed. And seven of those nine, I'm sorry, six of those nine have occurred since 2012. There was, of course, uh, I mentioned before, the Luby's cafeteria, 23 people killed, uh, and 21 killed at the McDonald's, and, and of course, Virginia Tech, 2007. Um, now, a lot of this issue about the growing number of victims has to do with the AR-15, its popularity and its dangerousness and deadliness. But it's not just that, because, for example, the 23 killed in, in Colleen, Texas, and the, the 32 killed at Virginia Tech, that was with a handgun, a Glock, but it could accept a large capacity magazine. Clearly, that's a significant issue in terms of the ability to continually shoot without having to reload. So why this disconnect between this idea that people have that it's an epidemic, and I get asked all the time about this raging epidemic, and the numbers which really don't support that. Well, there's, and, and you can see here in this interview I did with Jake Tapper on CNN, that he said it was hard to believe that there's no epidemic when it seems like it happens every day. Well, there's two reasons why there's a disconnect between reality and perception. Uh, one is confusion about the definition of a mass shooting. And the second has to do with the amount and the nature of the media coverage. I'll deal with these one at a time. So in 2013, You've probably heard of this group. The Gun Violence Archive decided, well, you know, there's nothing in the term mass shooting that says that people have to die. So they said, well, instead of four more people killed, how about four more people shot, whether they're killed or they're injured? 
that's a mass shooting to them. Now, it's fine as long as you don't conflate the two. But unfortunately, that happens all the time. Here's a graphic from CBS News where they, they basically say there's more mass shootings than days of the year. But in the graphic, you probably can't see that. I can't, that's for sure. All of those cases they list here are large scale mass shootings with, with dozens of people killed sometimes, double digit death tolls. So it does seem, if you look at this slide, this image on the graphic that was on television, that these kind of things that are listed here are happening daily. Well, I respect the work that they do at the Gun Violence Archive, but let's also understand that the average number of people killed in these mass shootings is one. And half of the cases, no one's killed. And 75% of the cases, zero or one deaths. Now, a few of them have large numbers. So uh, just over almost 6% of their hundreds a year, hundreds and hundreds a year. Last year, over 600. Uh, only 6% are mass killings, which is the traditional definition. Four more people killed by gunfire. It's something I've been using for four decades and is something actually the FBI used as well. Okay, whoops. Something happened here. Do you see it? By the way, oh, it's because. Thank you. Okay, so there's a so we have to be very careful what, what, when we define this, and then cite statistics. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. New York Times. You think they would get it right? Uh. Uh. New York Times. Uh, uses the gun violence ar archive definition. Washington Post, by the way, uses our data set. Uh, and a lot of media outlets like the gun violence archive because the numbers are big. You know, I mean, it's talking about hundreds. It sounds really important, scary, awful. Much more so than the dozens a year of mass killings. Uh, but you have to be careful. So here's this article that came out in May 2021, right after a, a mass shooting that occurred in Colorado Springs, where the guy uh, was mad because his girlfriend did not invite him to a birthday party that she was having for his, her relatives. He was so angry, he killed her and her relatives. What a party pooper. Um, anyway, here we see this list here partial list of mass shootings in the United States. This list is every single one of every single mass killing by gunfire that happened that year. It's the entire list of mass killings. But they say, this is an incomplete list. And these are many more. Yeah, but those many more aren't anything like this. So, and they don't say that. So it's very easy to get confused that mass confusion, because they conflate these two definitions. So that's a big problem. And why constantly people say to me, oh, this happens hundreds of times. And I say, no, uh, four or more people killed doesn't happen that often. Yo, it does, I read, read in the newspaper. All right, let me talk about schools. Uh, we've all been to school. Some of you have kids in school, or grandkids in school. Obviously, a big concern. Yeah, it's not a new concern. Back in 2001, Dan Rather, CBS News, declared school shootings in this country as an epidemic. And more recently, too, uh, The Nation magazine, the epidemic of school shootings. And we've had many widely publicized, very well known cases. You know, you got you know, uh, Parkland, of course, in 2018, and Uvalde. Uh, uh, two years ago. So it does seem like it's horrific. Obviously, you know, when, when children are killed, it has a special impact on the America's consciousness. Uh, so these cases with so many people killed makes a, has a big impact, clearly. But epidemic, we'll see. But a fear, again, we have the issue of fear. Um, 
you know, I have to admire the energy and the passion of the March for Our Lives group, the survivors of Parkland. They do some great work trying to convince our Congress that we need some gun control. At least some states have done good things. But a majority of the students here, as you can see, 57%, fear that's gonna happen in their school. This is not just part, this is a nationwide survey. A lot of fear. And, and the, the slogans, I wanna to go to my graduation, not to my grave. Well, that goes right to the heartstrings, but clearly <laughs> the chance of graduating is much higher than the chance you're gonna kill at school. So it's kind of hyperbolic. Uh, active shooter events, you know, that. Uh, defined by the FBI as uh, someone who goes into a public place and attempts to kill large numbers. I say attempts because actually in many active shooter events, no one's killed and sometimes no one's even injured. Guy just had the intent. In terms of schools, uh, from 2000 to 2022, according to the FBI data, there have been 50 in, in K through 12 schools, averaging two a year. But that's out of 130,000 schools. So clearly the risk of any school is quite, quite low. I'll get to colleges later, but in terms of college campuses, 18 over that time period, uh, one a year. And that's out of 5,000 colleges and universities. So clearly low likelihood, low risk, low probability. Now, let me show you this 50 year trend. These are shootings, fatal shootings, uh, that occurred during school, in school, during school. And actually, in the 1990s, there were more incidents than in recent years. The blue is the number of incidents. And I remember those well. I was on Bill Clinton's advisory committee on school shootings. We had a whole slew of them in the 1990s. Uh, of course, the biggest ones are labeled here caused the red, which is the number of, of deaths, fatalities, to spike. But in terms of incidents, there were actually more in the 1990s. And there really hasn't been that much of a change over those 40 years in terms of the blue. And occasionally a spike. Hard to say that's an epidemic. Horrible when it happens. Now, there's this widely publicized database called the K through 12 school shooting database uh, put out by the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. That has nothing to do with Homeland Security, by the way, it's a private center. And this is the recent graphic they have on their website and you can see this tremendous growth, over 350 school shootings last year. Wow. Such acceleration. Now they define school shootings, however, as a shooting on school property. Doesn't have to be inside the school. But before I get to that point, they started collecting data in 2018, which is when you saw the first jump. So <laughs> when the further back you go, the more difficult it is to find cases because the news archives aren't always that great back then. But since 2018, they've been collecting data concurrently. And it's easy, easy to find cases as you're looking for them in the present and they're finding them. So I really question the long-term trend there because I think it's really an issue of, of of uh, ability to capture cases from yesteryear as opposed to nowadays. Now I took the, all their data from 2010 to 2023 and tried to unpack it. In those uh, 14 years, there's 1,341 victims, a lot of victims. Well, let's break it down. There were 1,497 incidents in which there's any victims, but only 232 of them occurred in school. The rest 
in the playground, in the athletic field, uh, at night, when a husband and wife are arguing in the car, he drives into the parking lot and he kills her. Or over the weekend or in the summer. It has nothing to do with school. It just happens to be on school property. 15% of these incidents occur inside school, uh, which basically points out that so much of what we're talking about and doing in terms of active shooter drills, which I'll get to later, arming teachers, which I'll get to later, surveillance cameras, they have no relevance to 85% of the cases. Now, how about in terms of people killed? Well, 354 were killed over these 14 years. Uh, only 123 of them were in school. And of those 123 victims killed, 94 were students. So it's an average of about six a year. And by the way, five times more students are killed every year commuting to school, you know, bicycle accidents, a private car, a school bus, then are killed in school by an, arm, arm, by an assailant. And by the other 94, uh, two thirds of them are linked to just those four cases, Parkland, Santa Fe, Uvalde, and, and Sandy Hook. So the numbers dwindle as you deep down, uh, dig into the data. Now, this is the percentage of school shooting incidents that occurred in the school as opposed to in the property. And it's gone down. By the way, it's now down to 9%. And what that really suggests is that it's very hard, the further back you go, to find shootings that occurred on school property when we're, had nothing to do with students, nothing to do with the school. So the further back you go, he wasn't finding all of those cases that occur in school property. Only the ones that occurred in school, because those get a lot of press. So that really accounts for, I believe, the big increase that he touts, that the David Reisman touts. All right, how about um, college campuses? By the way, I, start, I forgot to start my timer, so let me look what time it is. Um, also rare, I mean, we had obviously the spike in 2007 with uh, Virginia Tech and uh, Northern Illinois University, not far from here. But overall, on average, about 10 to 15 homicides on campus. Those aren't necessarily students. And they're not necessarily random shootings. Most of them are like roommates killing each other or boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, in fact, only 55% of the victims here are students. So I know that when it happens, camp, uh, parents of college students start asking, what's your lockdown procedure? As if you can lock down a campus. Uh, okay, I understand they, they, you know, the kids are off, the, the, the kids are not under their watchful eye and they worry in the wake of a shooting at Michigan State, for example, or UNLV. But again, hasn't really increased. Uh, and by the way, this, this is a whole, I can't, you probably can't read them, but this is a list of all the multiple fatality shootings on college campuses going back to the early 1990s. So over 30 years and 27 incidents, about one a year. And 118 victims. And by the way, the most likely perpetrators of these are not undergraduates, like Cho from Virginia Tech, but graduate students, law students, medical students, and former medical law are graduate students. Uh, for many of these students, they uh, have a, they lose balance in their lives. They spend all the time in the library or the lab. They subsist on Doritos and pizza, forsaking their, all their friends and relationships, maybe their marriages. And when it comes to the time after many, many years of pursuing that degree single-mindedly, they find out that they're just not going to get it. They, they don't pass the bar or the uh, medical exams or whatever your exam is, or they don't get their, their PhD, they don't 
finished their PhD. They had nothing to fall back on and, and they're really bitter because they feel they've been uh, strung along. And many of them in these situations have gone on rampages, killing the faculty who they blame. All right, the other issue I mentioned before has to do with publicity. And, you know, I, I mentioned before they, they're shooting at, at, a, at an elementary school in Stockton, California, which no one remembers. It wasn't covered on television because those are the 80s. There was only one cable news channel then, CNN, but it was in its infancy. Didn't have much of a market. And we didn't have all the satellite trucks and the helicopters beaming images into living rooms. So when this happened, you know, they were the new, the traditional TV stations weren't about to preempt days of our lives in general hospital. They had nothing to show. So they'd say, oh, the bulletin has been a shooting. We'll talk about it at 11 or maybe the next day when they get some video. But when Sandy Hook happened, the media was there oh, very quickly. Yeah, it was right, right outside of New York. And I remember that I was uh, working for, MS, uh, for uh, NBC then as a news analyst. And it was media everywhere. And they were there so quickly that images of children being let out of this school with tears still fresh in their eyes were shown in high definition in people's living rooms. Made it feel like it was happening down the street. Had a tremendous effect. Unlike previous ca cases in the 80s and the 90s that were not covered live. And then Virginia Tech, I remember that very well. That was Marathon Monday in the city of Boston. You know, we had the Boston Marathon. And I ran the, I ran the marathon that day. I, I know I don't look it, but I did. I ran the marathon, but I ran the width of it. 26.2 feet. Most people do the length, you know. And I was exhausted. <laughs> but I, and I went and got some, some pasta. Uh, anyway, I got home, turned on the TV set, and there was marathon coverage of shooting at Virginia Tech. And as the death toll rose, the, the, the uh, anchors were getting giddy. Oh, now there's six killed. Oh, now it's eight. Oh, now it's 13. It's now the largest school shooting in history. Oh, now it's 20, and, and now it's 30. It's the largest shooting in America. People get excited when things are records. It's the deadliest, it's the worst, it's the biggest, it's the baddest. As if, well, let me give an example. I, I was at a, an event in my neighborhood shortly after the shooting at the movie theater in, in Aurora, Colorado, where 12 people were killed. And one of the people there was a, one of our local anchors in the news. And, I, and she said to me, is is that movie theater shooting the largest mass killing of all time? I, I said, no, that would be the Oklahoma City bombing. Oh, she said, that, that's a bombing. I mean, shooting. This is the largest shooting ever. I said, no, that would, that would be Anders Breivik, killed 77 in Norway. Oh, that's Norway, she said. I, went, I meant the United States. Largest shooting in the United States? Nope, that was Virginia Tech, 32 people killed. Oh. Well, what? They said, what if I take the number of people killed, 12, and add to it the number of people injured, 58, that's 70. Is that the largest shooting in American history? I said, yeah. Okay. Good, because that's what I'm going to lead with on the news tomorrow. I had to find some way it was a record, make it more important. I mean, look at this headline, Texas school shooting, Hills 10, deadliest since Parkland. It was three months later deadliest since three months. People love records. Uh, problem is records are made to be broken and they sometimes challenge a copycat to try to break the record. Uh, uh, Adam Lanza, the shooter at Sandy Hook, specifically was trying to outdo uh, Anders Breivik. Didn't come close, but he did kill 26 plus his mother the night before. So they said, you know, would it, be, it would be any less serious if it wasn't a record? No, not, not, a, not that focus, hyper focus on records. Um, all right, there's a movement in this country to, to uh, not name names, 
or show faces of criminals in the news, mass shooters, I mean. Uh, there was an open letter to the press signed by 142 criminologists. Uh, I refused to sign because I didn't agree. It didn't seem logical. If you killed two people, you can be in the newspaper, three people in the newspaper, or all four, forget it. Uh, or serial killers, we make movies about them. Or gangsters like Whitey Bulger. But the thing is, it's the act, not the actor, that like-minded people applaud. There are people who were so thrilled, white supremacists, thrilled with what happened in, in Walmart in, te in Texas. They don't know the guy's name. They wouldn't be able to pick his face out of a lineup. They just like what he did. We're not gonna have a news blackout on what these people do. So I believe that the basic facts about the perpetrator, that's news. Now, sometimes they do cross the line. I, for example, again, New York Times, uh, Song Yu Cho, the shooter at Richard Tech, as you may recall, after killing two people in the dorm, he went to the post office to mail videos to NBC, hoping they'll show them. And they did, unfortunately. And New York Times got it. And they put this picture on the front page above the fold of him brandishing weapons. Shows him being so powerful. I have no problem with the headshot. But this, ah. Um, and we get so much fluff about them. You know, with the Las Vegas shooter, we know his shoe size, what he ate the night of the shooting, with fav his favorite casino games, they like karaoke. And here is a picture of on his high school tennis team that has been all over the newspaper, uh, the news and the websites, as if that's a warning sign being a high school tennis player. My granddaughter was just <laughs> with the, um, captain of a high school tennis team. So hopefully that's definitely not true. Uh, sometimes we go from news reporting to celebrity watch by this excessive uh, fluff, human, it humanizes the killers. And, and I know this, that was another CNN and, uh, appearance. Uh, the, the, the host got so angry when I suggested that, the, uh, that the, too much publicity makes a celebrity watch. I wasn't criticizing her or CNN. I was just talking about the general state of affairs, but she took it personally. I, I much prefer stories uh, that focus on strength and resilience as opposed to misery, like, like the citizens of El Paso lining up to give blood for people they don't even know. And absolutely, can the media stop using the word manifesto? The, the, the shooters don't use it. You know, if you look it up, manifesto is a policy statement of someone who's prominent, not a criminal, not a mass killer. And uh, the one good thing that Dylan Roof said, the shooter at the South Carolina uh, church, he says, don't call my writing a manifesto. It's just a bunch of rants. Thank you, Dylan, for that one important piece of information. Um, there's this notion of contagion. Uh, and it, it really got a boost by a study done by a statistician from Arizona, Sherry T Towers, in 2015, who showed by analyzing the USA Today data, which was the precursor of the database I manage, uh, that looking at the timing of killings, that that after a mass killing, mass shooting, the number, the risk of the being another one, stay increases for 13 days. Got a lot of a lot of press. But the thing is, she didn't include in her analysis any measure of how much publicity they get. Most mass shootings get hardly any. Gang shootings don't get much. Family killings don't get much, except in the local area. If, if, if a mass shooting doesn't get publicity, how can it have an impact on other ones? So what we did is we went back and, and looked at how much publicity mass shootings got every single day of the year from January 2000 through 2018. And then looked at when 
public mass shootings, those are the ones that get the press, occurred. Uh, we use a te technique called multivariate point processing, cross multivariate point process modeling. It basically looks at, at the timing, but also includes covariates like how much publicity. And what we found basically is that mass shootings create a lot of publicity, as you can see. Starts high, starts dissipating for after a couple of weeks. But mass shootings do not rise, uh, do not, mass shootings do not create, I'm sorry, mass shootings create publicity, but publicity does not create mass shootings. Not, doesn't. Uh, but there's other kinds of contagion. Um, a public obsession, endless talk and worry about an event. That does have some contagion. The best example is again, back in the 1990s, there were between 1996 and 2001, there were eight multiple victim shootings at schools with at least four people killed. I'm sorry, at least two people killed, at least four people shot. There were eight of them. That was when Bill Clinton got involved and the Department of Education sent to every school in America a pamphlet called Warning Signs, things like a child who brings a weapon to school. <laughs> That's a warning sign they, they claimed. How, um, how insightful. Uh, and then Dan Rather, after one that occurred in March of 2001, said uh, the epidemic. Then there was not another one for four years. I don't think it was Dan Rather's declaring an epidemic that, had, that, that caused a lull of four years. No, it was 9-11, because after the March of 2001 incident, we had summertime, no school shootings in summertime. Then we had September 2001. And after that, no one was talking about school shootings. Everything was the press, public, everything was about terrorism, Al-Qaeda. And once we stopped talking about it, we've no longer fueled the contagion that told kids and normalized the idea if you don't like you, your classmates, you're angry with them, shoot them. So, uh, I did mention drills earlier, I hate them. Uh, you know, and some the schools really try to make them realistic. That's, they use fake blood, have some guy running around with a gun, uh, and some schools have unannounced drills, surprise kids. In fact, Parkland had unannounced drills. And when the real thing happened, a lot of the teachers were confused, didn't even know there was a, really a, a mass shooting. Thought it was one of those unannounced drills. And some schools even uh, have unannounced drills and they get on the PA system and they say, this is not a drill when it really is. Uh, the problem is, and by the way, almost every state requires them in the light blue and the dark blue recommend them. And some schools do it four times a year. Parkland, after Par the whole county after Parkland, 10, 10 uh, drills a year. Overkill. Um, and the evidence is, is clear how traumatizing it is for many students. Uh, this was a study done in Georgia, Georgia State, um, where they looked at tweets sent by students before and after a drill. And after the drill, the number of tweets that reflected depression, anxiety, fear, went up significantly. Now that's, I understand that. You know, when I was, I'm old. We had, we had the duck and cover drills about the atomic bomb. I never thought about the bomb. I only thought about what was, what are they gonna serve for lunch? And was I gonna get a chance to eat my lunch or were the bullies gonna take my money? That was what I worried about, but not the bomb. I was only 11, didn't think about it, except when we had those drills. Then I'd go home and I'd worry about it and think, what would it be like if the bomb dropped? Now, <laughs> looking back, I grew up in Boston area, Looking back on it now, I, I know that if a bomb fall, fell in Boston, that desk wouldn't have helped. It would have been vaporized, and so would I. I think, and, and schools run these bills 
these drills, like have kids sit in the corner six times a year and be quiet. It's not hard to tell kids to sit in a corner. So a lot of it can be done verbally as opposed to making me go through these drills. That basically says the bad guy's out to get you. We wouldn't be doing this if you weren't in danger. They should take lesson from the airlines and the cruise lines. I, I flew here this morning. They, you know, the, the flight attendant said something about water landings. No one paid attention. I was busy, my, you know, getting my last email sent. We just know if something bad happens, we'll listen to the crew. And I, my my son's a pilot, jet blue pilot. I know they go through lots of training. And uh, so I basically train the teachers, train the administration, but but, live, but low key it for the kids. Our cruise lines, I love cruise lines. My first cruise, uh, they came over the announcing the PA system. They said, uh, go to your muster station. I had no idea what muster was. I thought I brought a hot dog. I, I did, we did, all we did was put the life jackets on. And they told us which lifeboat it is, but we didn't actually get in the lifeboat. We didn't, actually, didn't lower us down because if they did that, I would never take a cruise again. And if they did it on a plane, oh, let's do a drill. Forget it. I'm not flying. And, you know, after Virginia Tech's colleges were desperate for something. And the security company in um, Seattle, which knew nothing about higher education, they made a video. And they sold it for over $1,000 to over 1,000 colleges. They made a lot of money. But they, they didn't know what they were talking about. For example, one suggestion for college students was when you go into a classroom like this, sit on the aisles so you can make a quick exit if someone comes with a gun. Well, uh, if I went into a classroom and all the students were in the aisles and no one in the middle, I'd have to talk out of both sides of my mouth, which I do anyway, but not, not appropriate. Um, let me talk about some telling characteristics of, of assailants and get into some suggested remedies. There are a lot of myths about mass shooters that they suddenly snap and kill everything and everyone that moves indiscriminately, hardly ever. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> A guy gets reprimanded or fired by the boss, and he just so happens to have two AR-15s and 2,000 rounds of ammunition in the trunk of his car just for such an occasion, just in case. No. These are well-planned executions. Um, and, yeah, some kill strangers who are in the wrong place at the wrong time, but most kill people they know for reasons that to them are real. Also, very few of them are psychotic. We'd like to believe that to make, well, they're different. They're all crazy guys. Oh, they're um, high on, on drugs or alcohol. Very few, by the way, high on drugs or alcohol when they go through these shootings. <laughs> it takes a lot of clear thinking to carry out these rampages. Um, and, and sometimes they're very selective. This, this is a Michael McDermott who killed seven in near my hometown, at his workplace. He was so pissed off because he owed money to the IRS and the IRS made a deal with his employer that they were gonna garnish his wages. He thought that would show tremendous disloyalty by his company. So one day, uh, it was Christmas, he went into work, work was closed, went into work, brought guns. Next day after Christmas, walked in, got his guns and started shooting. But only people in human resources and accounting, because those were the enemy. Those are the bad guys. Everybody else left alone, very selective. And according to FBI study, two thirds of these guys are active shooters. They plan for months what they're gonna do, not spontaneous. I mean, the great example, of course, is the Columbine shooters. They plan for a year. And they had all, all they, they, they targeted, they, they targeted uh, Hitler's birthday. They weren't neo-Nazis, they just admired the power that Hitler represented. And, but in this diary, I don't know if you can read it, they say that if they happened to survive the shooting at, at Columbine, maybe the next move 
would be to hijack an airplane and fly it into the skyline of New York City. This was two years before 9-11. You know, when 9-11 happened, people said, who, who could imagine? It's unfathomable that someone would use an airplane as a weapon. Well, these kids thought of it. And when they go through these shootings, people say they're so calm, they're smiling. Of course they're calm. They're not surprised. <laughs> you are. The victims are. And they're happy because they've been planning this for months. And finally, the day of reckoning has come. And they're really happy about it. All right. Sometimes we do the right thing, but for the wrong reason. Now, lots of people, as you know, like to point to, well, mental, we just need to improve mental health. It's not a gun issue. They deflect from that. Uh, not to say Obama did, but this interesting speech he gave in Hartford, Connecticut, not long after the Sandy Hook shooting. We need to help people struggling with mental health problems get the treatment they need before it's too late. Well, why? Is it so, oh, for whom is the concern? Are you so concerned about the well-being of the mentally ill, or are you concerned about the well-being of the people they may shoot? It's the latter, which only reinforces the stigma associated with, with mental illness. And the data show, the Columbia data set that some of you have seen, that only about 5% of mass shooters are, reflect severe mental illness and psychosis. Yeah, there's another 25% that are depressed. That makes sense. I mean, happy people don't do this. But you really can't blame the mental illness. And the other thing about it is mass shooters, they see themselves as victims of injustice. The boss doesn't give me the raise. The wife doesn't understand me. They want treatment, not psychological treatment. They want fair treatment. And if you offer them psychological treatment, they say, hell no, nothing wrong with me. It's just treat me fairly, everything will be cool. So, but the thing is expanding mental health in this country is the right thing to do for the millions of Americans who could benefit. Will it prevent mass shootings? I don't think so. But at least it gets people talking. But then we don't talk about expanding mental health on some random Tuesday. We do it the day after a mass shooting, which by conflating mass shooting and mental illness, we reinforce that stigma. Guns, lots of good ideas. Joe Biden talked about a lot of them last year. And the ir irony is that, that mass shootings have the greatest impact in, in creating some energy and momentum toward gun control, but they are the least likely homicide to be prevented by it. Because these guys are very determined. They will find a way to get the gun that they need. For example, I um, looked at, let's say universal background checks, which I support, truly. Uh, I looked at all the mass, public mass shooters from 2000 on. Um, and how many of them are prohibited by federal law? That is, they had a criminal record, felony record, or they had been institutionalized involuntarily. And two thirds could buy a gun legally. They didn't have that. And the one, the one third that couldn't buy it legally, they found other ways. Private sale, stealing, borrowing the parents, for example, or, for, or relatives, uh, building a gun, a ghost gun, like buy a kit. There's ways, if they want, if they really determine, they will get it. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do this. I think we should. But what really has an effect, and we looked at we looked at state by state, that the states that had permits to purchase, which is a much more thorough background check than what the FBI does. Those states, have, and about nine states that have that, have significantly lower rates of mass shootings. And the states that have bans on large capacity magazines, they have significantly fewer casualties, deaths and injuries when they do occur. That has a significant effect. Now, there is a wrong place for guns. 
this idea that teachers should be armed. Uh, many states now allow it. Concealed carry for teachers, for the faculty. You know, for, for teachers, marksmanship is about A's and B's, not guns and ammo. They should be educating students, not executing them. Uh, you know, we don't have, we don't have cops teaching math and we shouldn't have math teachers being cops. On ca college campuses, I'm getting near the end because I'm about a little over. Um, when, when Virginia Tech happened, there was one state, Utah, that allowed anyone with a permit to have a gun on campus. After Virginia Tech, this group, Students for Concealed Carry on campus, a grassroots organization, started pushing legislation state by state to allow permit holders, people who have legal guns, to bring them on campus. And boy, they've had some success. Only 10 states prohibit it. Mine and yours, I'm happy to say, in the green. Um, I don't think these guns have a place on college campuses because when you have depression, suicide, excessive drinking and drug use, you don't want to throw guns into that mix. Okay. The message I have that there's not an epidemic is often misunderstood. The NRA loves to, to quote me. Probably because it gives them more credibility if they quote someone who's a gun control advocate like me. Questioning some of the uh, statements that people are making about gun control and school shootings, for example. So they like to promote me. No thanks, but they do. Uh, and then, years ago, I did a, a podcast for Reason.com about four or five years ago. And the host tweeted out a, uh, a promo that basically said that the, there's no evidence that we're in the midst of an epidemic of mass shootings, according to me, leading ag researcher on the topic. Well, that was retweeted by Laura Ingram, and then retreated by Donald Trump, who was president at the time. I, I, it did increase my number of followers by 3,000, not necessarily the people I want to be followed by. And I appreciate that this idea had got some play, but the problem is, it, it, it's not an epidemic, but it's a problem. It shouldn't be ignored. There are things we can do and should do. And actually, things we can do and should do, they'll have a much bigger bite on the over 20,000 gun homicides we have a year. Not the handful that we have that are large scale. Finally, there's actually some, well, I'd like to end on a high note. I don't have one. I only have a note that's just not that low. That this year, is amazingly calm in a relative sense. You know, if, if Sir Isaac Newton had been a criminologist, he would have said, what goes up must come down. Well, that's true with, with crime numbers. You know, when we have spikes, spikes tend to be followed by declines. And so far this year, and you know, we're almost halfway through, the gun violence archive definition, four more people shot, down 30% from this time last year. That's good. Still people are being shot, that's not good, but it's good that this was fewer. And how about, how about uh, mass shootings with four more people killed, the ones that we define? They're, they've been cut in half, 11 so far this year compared to 22 this time last year. Last year actually was a record. It was 38 mass killings by gunfire, which was a, which was a record. I, I shouldn't use that term, record. But the most we've ever had. This year is down tr tremendously. And there's been zero public mass killings by guns. None. Now, I, I, you know, I hate to knock on wood. You should all do that too. We hope that continues.
But what is clear is that is the dramatic uh, situation we had last year where there were 10, I, that's not gonna happen this year. So that's what I got. I appreciate your listening. And if you have, you can clap now. And I can stay for questions if you have some. I have answers. Hopefully they'll match your questions. I wanna, we'll go ahead and um, ask some questions. I know a lot of you have to run, but if you can stay, please, you're welcome to answer questions. So anyway, so I think that you spoke really well to one, there's a conflict between not only the media and politicians, but different academics about what is mass killing, mass shootings. And, um, and in particular, we had, um, a, a, what do you call it? A, a, a workshop here by the Secret Service earlier this year about the epidemic and mass shootings. Anyway, so one thing I just want to raise a really important fact, and that is that the National Institute of Health that um, you know has now taken on gun violence has never once funded a mass shooting gun um, prevention project ever, but they are funding all the anxiety that students are feel, feeling right now and the cortisol levels that have increased post um, like the fire drills or the mass shooting drills that are going on in schools and how much children fear being shot to the point that we can measure their cortisol levels. So I find that really interesting. So anyway, so having said that, does anybody have questions for Jamie Fox? We had a workshop here. Is that yeah, what? yeah, right. Well, I was out of town, so I think Marianne attended it, and I'm sure it was pretty, it was a crisis, wasn't it, Marianne? Yeah. When my wife and I go away, we go to a workshop. I work, she shops. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions, were there any questions online that happened? Okay. About what we wait for people to think. Um, we actually have two. Um, start with the newest one. So, what are your thoughts of defensive gun use to stop mass shootings? I think you cover this a bit, but sure. Good like question. Defensive gun use. The, the the pro gun folks say we need to, you know, to have guns there to to uh, neutralize the shooter, cut down the number of people who are shot by overtaking them. Uh, it's hard to find those cases. There, for example, I know several cases where people had, where in states where there's a lot of concealed carry, and what happens when the shooting starts, they run. They're scared and they're frightened and surprised. And so it's, there are very few cases where someone intervened. There's been interventions, but not necessarily with guns. Uh, there's been a uh, principal who tackled a shooter in a school shooting incident. Uh, the problem with that too, and, and, and I bring that up in case of colleges, for example, you know, if we allow students to have guns on campus and if there is a shooting and the campus police come, they should have guns. How are they gonna tell the bad guys from the good guys? You got the bad guy wearing blue jeans and a backpack and a gun, and you have all the good guys with blue jeans, backpacks, and guns. You know, the bad guy doesn't wear like special clothing to indicate that, well, sometimes they do. <laughs> sometimes they wear masks and camouflage, but usually no. Uh, and in fact, some interesting experiments have been done where they give people, give students in class um, paintball guns and then they have a someone come in and they, they know this is going to happen because they're all given paintball. Someone comes in and then they start shooting. And unfortunately, there's people not the shooter isn't necessarily killed, but lots of other classmates are caught in the crossfire. So it's a bad idea. In my mind, I understand the logic, but it just doesn't happen that armed individuals respond in that way. Occasionally it does, but not all that often. Not enough to, to justify it in my mind. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, one over here. So um, could you speak to the role that uh, gender plays within mass shootings? I know Brenda Spencer, is the only female um, that comes to mind as far as someone who 
carries on a mass shooting. In terms of the victims? Uh, in terms of, no, the, the perpetrators. Oh, like you... Brenda Spencer, the, the Cleveland um, elementary shooter in 79. Yeah. Um, she was a woman, a young girl. So, um, you know, is there... There were only very few female mass shooters, 5%. And the ones that there are tend to be family annihilators. They kill their kids and then themselves and reunite the family in the afterlife. Uh, it's called suicide by proxy, by seeing the kids as an extension of her. Um, not a lot of cases of women. I mean, the sh it was a shopping mall in, in Springfield, Pennsylvania, uh, a woman who was mentally ill brought an AK-47 into the mall and started shooting, killed three. So it does happen, but, but not a lot. I mean, look, homicide is a male thing. 90% of homicides committed by men. And when it comes to the most extreme homicides, it's 95% are men. Now, victims, uh, majority, more female victims than male. But that's because in the family cases, which are almost half the mass shootings, um, the family cases, you have the wife who's female and then you have the kids who are 50-50. So you'll have slightly more females victims. Uh, I know there, was, there have been people who suggest that some of the school shooters have specifically gone after females. Uh, and the, the evidence in terms of the, the numbers don't, don't really back it up. Oh, let me say one other, one other thing. Then there's this whole, we had the, the, uh, the trans issue. And there's been a couple over the years committed by trans individuals. And when it happened, boy, that gave the fodder to the <laughs> anti-trans folks to say, oh, look, they're mass shooters. Well, actually, when you do the rate, uh, they're not more likely, they're actually less likely to be mass shooters. Yes, another question. So I um, apologize if I'm asking a question that you had presented in the, in the uh, message I got in here halfway through, but I was curious about the, uh, we are talking about common themes of the mass shooters, and I saw a little bit about domestic violence and mental illness and the like, but was there any, would you look at past activities past what the activities that the individuals were involved with such as gaming or sports or non-sports or uh things like that um would be other examples uh, subjects they studied in school you know were there other and not right i get you're trying to maybe find predictors at that point isolation things like that was there anything that teased out that way? Not that, you know, you'd get some preventable ideas there, but at least what was anything like that come out? Well, we, first of all, generally, there are several factors that are very common among mass shooters. Social isolation is one of them. That they don't have, they live alone, or they live with, they live with others, but they don't, not people they can relay their problems to. So they don't have a, a support system, and they don't have a reality check. So when they think that they are being singled out and mistreated by the company, they have no one around to say, hey, let's think about this rationally. You're not the only one who X, Y, and Z. So I, social, isolate, uh, social isolation. Another factor is that mass shooters tend to externalize blame. You see, if you blame yourself for all your misfortunes and failures, you might decide to take out your feelings on yourself in terms of suicide, punishing yourself. But what's true about mass shooters, they don't see that they're the problem. So every time something bad happens in their lives, it's someone else to blame. And they eventually decide they're gonna go and punish those people who cause them so much anguish because it's not their fault, it's their, everybody else's fault. Um, so those are some, and that, those are some key fails. Also, failure. We know we know the frustrate failure frustration uh, hypothesis. It's true. I mean, we have. It's often the case with mass shooters is they have 
a history of failure. It, problems in school, problems in relationships, problems at work. To the point that their ability to cope with life's frustrations and failures begins to win so thin, we're so thin that they just don't see any hope. They don't see the idea that there's no hope. Why live any why live? But before they take their own life, they want to get other people who they hold responsible. Now it could be people at work. We had that yesterday in Philadelphia. Two killed, three injured. It could be the family. What, blaming the wife, she, you know, uh, she kicked him out of the house. You know, if I can't have the kids, no, no one can, especially not you, lady. Um, so, so, basically, so, so um, blame is an important part of the equation. Now, things like games, like video games, it, it's very tempting, and some people do it, they, to, to look for things like video games as the cause. You know, we know, for example, when Adam Lanza, the shooter at Sandy Hook, um, he was on the spectrum and he spent long hours playing video games. Not all of them violent. His, one of his favorites was something called Dance Dance Revolution. I don't know what it really is, but it's not, it's not violent. It has to do with dancing. Um, so, Essentially, the connect, you know, when you also look at the, the millions of Americans who, who are fascinated with violence, violent movies, violent TV shows, violent video games, well, they're not mass shooters. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say that's a cause. Um, domestic violence, actually, it was interesting, but that when we had this, the Sutherland Spring shooting in in Texas. I was actually an ex expert witness on that case. And when it happened, this uh, shooter um, had five years earlier uh, been court martialed in the military, in the Air Force, because he had, he had uh, beaten his wife and child. So he was court martialed, convicted of domestic violence, five years before the shooting at a church where he killed 26. And then there was a stu this study by every town for gun safety that said 52% of mass shootings are associated with domestic violence. And I remember I was on, a, on a, another CNN show right after the shooting and, and this other guest start saying that majority of mass shooters have a history of domestic violence. And I said, that's not true. It's, it's around 20%. Oh no, is that study 52%? Well, that's because the 52% are either having a history of domestic violence or the act itself is met domestic violence. So when 46% of mass shootings are in the family, well, that's domestic violence. So it's yeah, very easy to misunderstand these things about cause. But essentially, even though there are common characteristics about mass shooters, uh, it's much, those same characteristics are much more likely than the general population. Or let's say being male. I mean, 95% of mass shooters are male, but doesn't mean being male is a predictor. A lot of false positives we can say, Mass shooter, mass shooter, mass shooter, mass shooter. So you can't predict. The problem thing is you can't predict. It's a rare event, fortunately. And any rare event is impossible to predict. It's needles and haystacks. Is there a lot of work on the long-term effects of mass shootings or threats of mass shootings, active shootings on the people who were not the victims, so you, a school, the school continues. What happens to the students who were not victims? Are they impacted? Well, they can be. And I, I can't say that there's much research on that. I know the Washington Post maintains a database where, the, where what they've done is they look at school shootings and then they take the uh, enrollment of those schools 
and they discount it by a certain um, absentee rate. And then they have the, they claim there's hundreds of thousands of children in America have been impacted by school shootings. Doesn't necessarily mean that they have significant lasting effects. Uh, I'm sure some do, particularly if they knew the victims well. But when you have a high school of, um, you know, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, I'm Columbine, big high school. Um, it's, it's obviously they're glad that they weren't shot, but they, a lot of them can just move on. But it's a good question and an interesting study to do but not easy to do. Any other question? Otherwise, I guess we're about ready to close out then. All right, thank you so much.